boss and he seems to be conducting even though no one's there. He started doing it in private, which was fine and all, but now he's doing it in public. <laughs> he's even doing it in staff meeting. All right, so we're doing, uh, talking through Christmas Eve service. Mm -hmm. Tiger, you're doing all of the scripture all the way through? Apparently so. I've got uh, all of the readings basically in one document so that I don't have to put back and forth. It saved me a little bit of time. So. Who's doing the welcome? Is that wrong? I've got the welcome. You're doing the welcome. I'm doing the welcome. And I also have the closing. So all you have to do is your devotional and yeah, everything else is taken care of. So five minutes. We've been trying to figure out what he's missing. Then it clicked.
you pray with me? Father God, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come and worship you in this house of worship this morning. As we worship your name together.
beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is, the name Indeed, it is a beautiful name, isn't it, church? I invite you to be seated for just a moment. I'm going to lead us in prayer. I invite you to join me in prayer. And as I close this prayer, I'm going to close reading Ephesians 3, verses 14 through 21. Would you pray with me? Most gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the salvation that he brings. We thank you for giving us the most beautiful. Father, we've made it a week <laughs> into 2024. We thank you for that. I don't know what each individual in this Room. I don't know what the trajectory of this year is. As the old song says, we, we don't know what tomorrow holds, but we know who holds tomorrow. And I pray, Lord, that as we enter into this new year, the freshness, the, the excitement, the mystery, we know that you can and will direct our paths if we surrender our lives to you. We thank you for loving us so much that indeed you sent your son to this place, to this broken world, to be surrounded by the sin that envelops us all and yet to be himself sinless. What greater love. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. I pray that he may grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width and height and depth of God's love, and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Would you stand once again, please? We continue to sing praises. Make a rest. 
we walked through the Christmas season just recently, remembering how the Savior of the world was sent to us, bearing the name above all names, and now how perfect to begin a new year with the Lord's Supper in remembrance that he sent his son for us. John 129 says that John saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world.
Good morning. You can be seated. It's so good to see you this morning and so glad to be together for worship. Thank you our, to our praise team who covers so well when Austin is out. If you didn't know, he was on vacation this week, but still made it for service. He's tucked away hiding over there. Just look for the shiny head. So anyway, uh, uh, just play. Or the one directing while we still go, right? So anyway, uh, no, uh, great, uh, great morning uh, to start off our new year. And uh, I, I love starting our new year with the Lord's Supper. Um, and that's what we're doing today. We uh, are getting to observe one of the two ordinances of the church. Uh, we think about those two ordinances being baptism and the Lord's Supper, uh, what Christ has instituted for the church to, um, to be a part of and to do and to, and to um, uh, remind us of, uh, of, of what he has done in our life as we approach this time together. I want us to think on and focus uh, on the Lord's Supper, um, uh, to think about the importance of it from a historical standpoint, to think about it for, from uh, the time where it was established, from the disciple standpoint, and then also to remember uh, and to think about what it should mean for us today, where we are in our context. And to do that well, we have to understand what is going on in that first Lord's Supper. We think about the context of what was going on that last supper, that night that they were celebrating Passover. You see, that's what was going on that last supper. When the Lord's Supper is instituted, Jesus has decided to have a meal with his disciples together. But it wasn't just any meal and it wasn't just any night. You see, they were together because Passover was happening. And so they joined together to celebrate Passover. Passover was an important, maybe the most important Jewish holiday that there was, a, a time where they spent uh, 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 really uh, time celebrating the deliverance of God's people out of Exodus, right? That book at the very beginning of the Bible, right? And so they were reminded of that time. The meal was extremely important to the Jewish people. Matter of fact, it still is today. When we approach Passover, you'll even see, if you'll go look in the grocery stores, there's a section that'll have different foods and different things available that aren't always there because Passover is important and it's important to the Jewish people. And when they approach Passover, even still again today, Every food at the table has a meaning. Everything that is there is a symbol of something else, especially the lamb that is eaten on that night, which is a reminder of the blood that was smeared on the door doorpost before the exodus uh, the, to keep the death angel away. This meal was a ritual and a tradition, and it was a family celebration and as Jesus is celebrating it with, the Lord's, uh, with his disciples, there's no way to understand it if we don't link those together. The meal was a ritual. It had lots of symbolism. Matter of fact, throughout the meal, different things would happen that were traditional. The kids would ask questions to the parents. The father would answer Answer them by telling them stories about God, telling them stories about how God had delivered their ancestors from Egypt, stories of faith about how the people trusted in God. And the meal was a reminder of God's salvation, of how he had saved them. But what is also missed is that the meal also pointed to the Messiah. It pointed to the one who was to come. There were certain aspects that went on. The mill pointed to the importance of faith in God for salvation, and, and that's what saved the Jewish people from the Egyptians. It wasn't just that they put blood on the doorpost. It's that they trusted and put their faith in God, and so when he told them to do something, they did it. And on this night, when Jesus began talking about the bread and the wine being his body and blood, he began to give new symbolism new meaning to something that was already important. The disciples knew he was doing this. They knew that this was important. They knew that something was changing. They still didn't understand everything, but they knew that this new meaning would change their lives. 
And this morning, as we think about the Lord's Supper, I want us to understand, understand the importance of it from a historical context, understand the importance of it from the disciples' uh, point of view, and then to think about it for us today. And so if you will, please stand with me for reading of God's Word, Matthew chapter 26. We're going to read verses 17 through 30 together. I'll read along as you read, uh, I'll read aloud as you read along. It says, on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to, to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? Go into the city to a certain man, he said, and tell him, the teacher says, my time is near. I'm celebrating the Passover at your place with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. And when evening came, he was reclining at the table with the 12. While they were eating, he said, truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. Deeply distressed, each one began to say to him, surely not I, Lord. He replied, the one who dipped his hand with me in the bowl, he will betray me. And the son of man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been better for him if he had not been born. And Judas, his betrayer, replied, Surely not I, Rabbi. You have said it, he told him. And as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples and asked, Take and eat, this is my body. And then he took a cup after giving thanks, and he gave it to them and said, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my, blo for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when it, I drink it in a new way with you in my Father's kingdom. And after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. Father, we thank you for this time where we can think about a, a new year and a new beginning and come to this time where we come to the Lord's Supper to examine our hearts and, uh, Father, to be reminded of the importance of your sacrifice for us, to be reminded of the importance of faith in you. And, Father, I pray that as we approach the Lord's Supper this morning, Father, I pray first that we do it in a way that's honoring and glorifying to you, and yet also, Father, I pray that you do it in a way that is convicting to our hearts, helping us to see in which ways we need to come into obedience and bring ourselves into line with your desires for our life. Father, lead us and guide us as we study your word this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. We're going to look at three things quickly this morning as we begin to prepare for the Lord's Supper. We look at and think about the Lord's Supper. There are two main elements that we see in this passage and that we see in the Lord's Supper. The first is the broken bread. The broken bread. In Jesus' last Passover, the supper with his disciples, he took a piece of unleavened bread and he broke it. Now, this bread is different than what we often think of as bread, right? And, and we know some of this because we know the context, but this was different from normal bread that even they would have eaten. When Jewish women normally baked bread, they would have taken a piece of fermented dough, kneaded it into fresh dough, and they would have added yeast so it would rise, and then they would cook it, and, and it would be normal like, you know, the Texas Roadhouse rolls that we all love, right? <laughs> that was normal, all right? That was the normal but remember, on the night of that last plague, all the Israelites were instructed to take the blood of the lamb, wipe it over their door, wipe it on the doorpost, and when the death angel came, it would pass over the houses with the blood on the doorpost. Reality, remember this, this is the doors of the families who had faith in the blood, right? Okay? And so they would, they would place that blood on the doorpost, and so the Lord instructed them to be prepared to leave quickly. When the angel came through, God was going to deliver them. He was going to save them, and he wanted them to be ready to leave quickly. And so he told them, don't mess with the yeast. You don't have time for it to rise. You don't have time for it, so leave it alone. And so they, they, they would set out on the day of their salvation from Egypt, and a key part of the meal for them going forward was unleavened bread. Bread without yeast in it. Bread that is flat. Bread that seems like it's stale, right? I mean, that, that's what it is. Uh, we think about it, the closest thing we can envision is a cracker, right? Saltine cracker, something like that. To the disciples, the bread would have reminded them of the salvation their ancestors had experienced in their escape to Egypt. 
See, bread was normal bread for them, but on this day, on Passover, a portion of the meal was this unleavened bread, and that unleavened bread had significance. You know, we must also remember that the bread is basic nourishment for life. Do you realize there's no civilization that does not have some form of bread, right? Everywhere I've ever traveled, they always have some form of bread. Now, it looks different in different places, right? Uh, uh, some call it pan or pan or whatever. Some, it's a tortilla. Some, it's made out of flour. Some, it's made out of corn. But bread is always a basic staple of every civilization. It's something that is a, a staple, and as we remember that, we remember that God's word is even more important than bread. Deuteronomy 8.3 says, man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. You see, God's word feeds our soul while bread only feeds our physical bodies. And this bread in the Passover, it represented this departing of Egypt, this salvation that God had provided. They left quickly without using yeast for the bread. And this bread symbolized them being saved from the control and enslavement of the Egyptians. But now Jesus gives this bread a new meaning. He told them, not only does this bread represent salvation from Egypt, but now it represents the body of Christ. The body, he said, that will be broken for you. And the significance, this significance is here for us today. It serves as a reminder of our salvation, salvation that came through the broken body of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that he was bruised for our iniquities. And this means the reason he was tortured and died was not for what he had done. He was completely innocent, completely sinless. But his body was broken because of our sin, because of our rebellion, because of our bad choices. The reason he was beaten and killed was because of what we had done. It was our sin that caused his pain. Yet his broken body is what freed us from the enslavement to sin. The bread in the Passover represented a freedom from the enslavement of the Egyptians, but now it has changed. It represents a freedom from the enslavement to sin. The broken bread symbolizes our sin and his broken body. We must remember that as we come to the Lord's Supper. Secondly, we think about the new cup. The new cup. There was another important symbol in this Passover meal, the cup of wine. There are actually, if you lay out a Passover meal, there are multiple cups. And different cups are used at different times in the Passover meal. And so this was a specific cup. There are multiple cups in the Passover meal. And that, that night would have come, this would have come after the last cup of the meal. And the cup reminded the Israelites of two things. The blood that was shed each year to atone for their sins and the blood of the lamb that saved them from Egypt. So it would have been the, the, the uh, sacrifice that they would have made yearly, but it also would have reminded them of the blood over the doorpost, the faith that was displayed whenever they were saved from the Egyptians. And so like the bread represented Jesus' broken body, the cup represents Jesus' blood. Jesus told all of his disciples to drink from the cup. He wanted them to participate in drinking from this cup. He wanted this because he wanted them to recognize the importance and the symbol of his blood being shed for the entire world. And so when we drink, we should remember that Jesus paid the debt for our sin, that only his blood shed could do that. Only his blood shed could pay the price for our sin. Hebrews 9:22 it says, "Indeed under the law almost everything is purified with blood, but without the shedding of blood there's no forgiveness of sin." See, the Old Testament sacrifice had to be repeated every year. And the Passover and the cup going on during Passover is a reminder of that sacrifice every year. But now that sacrifice, that sacrifice has been fulfilled. It no longer has to go on every year. Aren't you thankful that we don't have to worry about the smell of blood in here? Because that blood has already been shed once for all. The perfect sacrifice that was given for us. His blood is the only way to make us right with God. And we should remember that God loved us so much that he allowed his son to die in our place. 
So when we drink from the cup, we should remember that Jesus literally shed his blood so that we can live. He literally shed his blood to pay for our sins, to atone, to purchase us back. So we see the broken bread. We see the new cup. Thirdly, in this passage, we see a conversation, a conversation that is important for us to understand. There's a lot of importance going on here during this conversation that is taking place around the table. And we don't know all that they talked about, right? You, you would have to think that during this meal, which would linger on potentially for hours, that there were lots of conversations that were going on back and forth between different people, between all of them together. But we catch a glimpse of part of the conversation that's going on when Jesus is changing the meaning of the Passover here. He is instituting what we now know and participate in as the Lord's Supper. And before Jesus took the bread and the cup, something very significant happened. He looked at his disciples and he said, one of you is going to betray me. One of you is going to betray me. Each one, one by one, the disciples look at him and said, surely not I, Lord, surely not I. And they work through all that is going on. And then, except for one, we look at it. And in Judas, his betrayer, he says, surely not I, Rabbi. We begin to catch a difference here. Maybe you've always wondered, how in the world could Judas betray him? How could he be so close to him for so long? How could he walk with him for three years? How could he see all the miracles? How could he experience his power? How could he do all of these things and still betray him? We see the key to that right here in this conversation. We see just a slight difference. The disciples answer, surely not I, Lord, but... Judas's response is, surely not I, rabbi. He sees him as a great teacher, as someone that knows the law, as someone that has taught him a lot, but he doesn't submit his life to him as Lord. As we come to the Lord's Supper, it is a time for us to evaluate our hearts and evaluate where we are. Are we submitting to him as Lord? Have we surrendered our will? Are we making him the authority of our life? Is he truly in charge? See, it was that Judas never regarded Jesus as Lord. He wasn't his boss. He wasn't his savior. He was just a good teacher to him. Y'all, this is what adds significance to the Lord's Supper. As we participate in just a few moments, whether you participate in the Lord's Supper really depends on this. How do you regard Jesus? Do you regard him as someone that, you know, can give you good direction for making decisions and has taught you a good way to go about life? Or do you see him as Lord? Do you see him as Savior? Do you see him as authority? See, if you don't see him, if you haven't placed your faith and trust in him as Savior and Lord of your life, then there is really no significance in what we are about to do. This is a symbol of what Christ has done for us. But if we haven't trusted him in faith, then that symbol means nothing to you. It means nothing. There's no real significance. See, this is the mark of a believer. This is the significance in the conversation from that night. Eleven of his disciples believed in faith. They celebrate the Passover where their ancestors had believed in faith. They trusted in the blood of the sacrifice. And so we come to the Lord's Supper this morning. It only has significance if we have believed in faith. Have we trusted in him as Lord and Savior? You see, the disciples didn't understand everything, but these 11, they believed he was the Messiah. And as they celebrated the Passover, it was pointing toward the one they were sitting with and they believed in him. They trusted in him as Lord, the authority, the boss of their life. The conversation from that night, it was important. It was significant. You know, the bread and the cup, they are important symbols. They're important symbols. Now listen, they don't literally turn into the blood or body of Christ when we consume them. But when we consume them, we are saying something specific. We are declaring that that Jesus made a sacrifice for us. 
that his body was broken and his blood was shed because of our rebellion. We are declaring that as we take these symbols and we are declaring that we identify with the sacrifice and we are thankful. And because of that, we give ourselves to him. He is our Lord. We give ourselves to him, our time, our lifestyle, our families, our job, everything that we are is given to him to direct us in life. He is our Lord and Savior. You know, the way the Bible tells us, the way we know whether or not he is our Lord is whether or not we keep his commands. Are we obedient to him? That's a hard, hard standard to keep. And we know we fail along the way. The Lord's Supper provides us a chance to examine our hearts to bring our lives in line with him so we can say we want to follow you as Lord and Savior of our life. We want to give thanks because we recognize the sacrifice that was made for us. This morning, as we prepare for the Lord's Supper, will you examine your heart? Have you truly trusted him as Lord and Savior? If you have and you're a believer, is your life line up with that? Well, today is the chance for us to bring those things in line. Will you do that as we prepare for the Lord's Supper this morning? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your love and your care for us. We thank you for the sacrifice that was made for us and how we celebrate that and see that in the symbolism of the Lord's Supper. And Father, I pray this morning, if there's someone here that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior of their life, Father, you would convict them of their sin and help them to see that the only forgiveness for that sin comes by trusting you as Lord and Savior. And Father, I pray for believers today. Many times we find ourselves all over the place. But Father, this morning, we pray that you would bring our hearts in line with yours. Help us to examine our hearts, repent and seek forgiveness. Father, lead us and guide us as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and sing a song of response. The altar is open if you need to come to pray or if you need to come and make a decision for Christ or a church decision. You can come and do that as we stand and sing this morning.
you may be seated. I'm gonna ask the hat makers to come up here and join me real quick. And uh, this is Adam and Cheryl Hatmaker with Emma and Cora and Carter. And I think I got everybody, all right? So uh, hat makers have been with us for a little while and uh, wanting to make that official this morning with a, a move by letter. And so I need a motion and a second to receive that letter. And uh, if, if say amen if you're in favor. Amen. And we're super excited about their move here with us. We are a little bit different today uh, with being Lord's Supper, so they're not going to be able to stay up here and you welcome them afterwards, but they're going to go back to their seat. I want to encourage you to go by and let them know, get to know them a little bit and, and encourage them in this move. We're super, super excited and, uh, and uh, excited to see what God has in store for us as we uh, come together. Y'all can be dismissed. We are going to prepare for Lord's Supper. I do want to remind you that if you do not have a cup, um, that as the song is going on, our deacons will have those. They'll be coming through and we'll be glad to help you with those as we prepare for the Lord's Supper this morning. chapter 22, starting verse 7 says, Then the day of unleavened bread came on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover meal for us so that we may eat it. Where do you want us to prepare it? He, they asked him. Listen, he said to them, When you have entered the city, a man carrying a water jug will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters and tell the owner of the house, The teacher asks you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished room upstairs, Make the preparations there. And they went and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. The hour came, and he reclined at the table, and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. 
Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you, from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. He took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. But look, the hand of the one betraying me is at the table with me. For the Son of Man will go away as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. In order to participate in the Lord's Supper, we ask that you be a baptized believer in Christ, that if not, we ask you to please not participate. We come to observe the Lord's Supper, given to us to celebrate the memory of his broken body and his shed blood. It's said that on the night before he was betrayed, at the conclusion of the Passover meal, which he and his disciples were celebrating, that he took bread and having blessed it, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Let us pray together. Father, we thank you for your broken body. How is a reminder of the sacrifice that you made for us. Father, I pray that you'd help us to remember and to be thankful for that today. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. John 6, 58 says, this is the bread that came down from heaven. It's not like the manna your fathers ate, for they died. The one who eats this bread will live forever. Take and eat. On the same night that our Lord took, took, he took the cup and having blessed it, gave it to his disciples and said, this is my blood which was shed for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your shed blood, for how we understand without the shedding of blood, there was no true forgiveness of sins. There was never a true atoning for sins. Father, we are thankful for your shed blood, for by it we can be forgiven. By it we can call you Lord and Savior. Father, we give thanks for that today. Hebrews 9.22 says, According to the law, almost everything was purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. And John, and 1 John 1.7 says, But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Take and drink. First Corinthians. 126 says, for as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It reminds us of the witness that he has called us to, that we are to share the good news about Christ as Savior and Lord. It says that after our Lord and his disciples ate the bread and drank the cup, celebrating the first Lord's Supper, that they sang a hymn and went out. And so we're going to stand together, join hands as you are comfortable across the aisles, and we're going to sing a song as we go, as we are dismissed today. Thank you.